Hi there, so uh, welcome to this session as part of the Global EdTech Academy. Uh, my name is Mark Anderson. Uh, people know me on social media and uh, through sharing through the various EdTech communities as the ICT evangelist. And my approach is to thinking about the use of technology in the classroom are firmly grounded in sort of evidence informed approaches. And during the session uh, today, um, uh, as part of the Global EdTech Academy, along with Q and Microsoft, um, I'm looking to share how to use Microsoft tools to improve the quality of explanations and modeling. Uh, welcome, Jessica, to the session. And so um, in this session, um, which is being recorded, so please be mindful of that. Um, uh, it does mean as well you can um, uh, sort of watch back again afterwards in an iPlayer Netflix kind of style. Um, uh, and uh, that's all available. I'll share the link to all of that uh, during my presentation uh, and all those things uh, during the course of the session. Uh, but I'm looking to uh, share with you different ways to improve the quality of explanations and modeling. Um, if you have got a question, please use the chat feature or the raise hand feature during the session. Uh, there is a section I built in at the end of the session to uh, get you to um, sort of come back with any questions and things then as well. So there's plenty of opportunity for you to engage with me and ask questions and, and all those sorts of things as well. So uh, thank you very much for coming to the session. So I'm just going to open my share tray. I'm going to bring up my presentation slides and I'll start to uh, work through that with that uh, with you uh, right now. So uh, that's not opening the right PowerPoints and that's not the best uh, of uh, starts. Uh, hi, Anama. Uh, welcome to this session. <laughs> I'm just looking to start the presentation now. So uh, that is absolutely not the right uh, presentation. Uh, I think someone's got their microphone on. If you have, please pop it off. So, so that's a bit of a, a bit of feedback coming through there. Uh, just going to open my share tray again and try and open the actual correct presentation this time. Oh, da -da -da -da. That's still not the right presentation, is it? Um, but, 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 but. I do like to make it the case that things do go wrong at least once during my presentation so that I can prove that uh, everyone, even the best of people, can uh, get things wrong sometimes. So there's my calendar. Uh, let's try doing this uh, instead. OK, here we go. This is the right one. OK, so yeah, welcome to this session then. Uh, hopefully you can see that John and, and uh, everybody else. So as I said, it's a session looking to explore uh, the ways in which we can use Microsoft tools to improve the quality of explanations and modeling. And it's part of the uh, Global EdTech Academy, um, which is taking place during the, uh, during the last few months and continuing through to the end of August. Uh, more than 400 hours worth of sessions available. And you can get to all of the sessions that are on, uh, on, on the schedule through q.org slash Microsoft. And um, the, you can watch the sessions back on the um, Q YouTube channel. Uh, I'll share the link to that in just a few moments. Um, but um, that's what that is. My name, as I said, is Mark, and uh, I go on Twitter as the ICT Evangelist. Uh, and all the sessions that are being run as part of the Global EdTech Academy uh, are using the hashtags Getter, uh, We Are Q, and Microsoft Edu. So please do check out those hashtags. The uh, hashtag that I use myself uh, um, is Ask ICT Evangelist. If you uh, want to ask me a question, please do use that hashtag. Um, and uh, I've got uh, software that sort of tracks that and get, sends all the questions through to me if I, I miss them on Twitter myself. So uh, any follow ups, please do uh, drop me a line. Um, and there are lots of ways to do that, but Twitter is always a great way of doing that. As I say, if you've got any questions, please do add those questions into the chat in Microsoft Teams. That would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, and do use the raise hand feature if you need to uh, sort of grab my attention because I can only really see uh, my screen at the moment while I'm presenting to you. Um, so just going to bring up my presentation full screen. So a few things I want to try and do live during the session as well. Um, so the session I said is looking at how we can use Microsoft tools to improve the quality of explanations and modeling. I'm going to start off by going through and thinking about the evidence and what the research says about how we can use technology to support uh, these kind of activities. Uh, we're going to think about then ideas of how we can do that using Microsoft tools. And then there's some time at the end, hopefully for a bit hands on if you've got access to uh, the software. Um, if not, I can demonstrate some things to you if you're interested. Um, but certainly there's time to ask questions and, uh, and sort of unpick a few things if you've got questions later on uh, towards the end of the session. So um, what does the research say? Uh, what is the evidence base? Um, where does it all come from? 
well, as I often share, it isn't so much what you do, it's the way that you do it, that Bananarama thing, uh, where I say it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. And there, there are many, many things you can do with technology, but just because you can do them uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you should uh, use them. So what are the uh, things that we can use to help us? Well, um, one place which is a great source of information for evidence-informed approaches to teaching and learning and, and all aspects um, of, of education is, is the, the research and, and things undertaken by the Education Endowment Foundation. Um, not just around using digital, and there, there are reports and guidances and guidelines and, and, uh, and uh, research trials and, and all sorts of things being shared by the EEF uh, via their teaching and learning toolkit. There's loads and loads of information uh, on there. Uh, their teaching and learning toolkit is something that I use regularly to help me think about uh, and keep me honest, as it were, uh, about how I best go about supporting schools with their approaches to teaching and learning. Two of the things which come out as being uh, some of the highest uh, and most impactful activities uh, from the toolkit um, are the ones around feedback and metacognition and self-regulated uh, learning. Uh, these have a very high impact uh, for a very low cost based on uh, for the most part, extensive evidence. You can see you know, high quality feedback, for example, there can give up to eight months additional progress to your learners um, if you are engaging and giving and supporting learners with high quality feedback and tying that in with metacognition, helping children, uh, your, your learners to understand how it is uh, to best learn. Uh, things around, um, let's say, retrieval practice, space in their practice, uh, all those different things, and, and then them self-regulating their learning uh, can again have a, a, a huge impact on their progress. Interestingly, uh, collective teacher efficacy is one of the things which comes out as being most high, um, and that is uh, something that comes in, sort of runs in parallel with the findings of John Hattie in his work with visible learning and uh, all of that sort of stuff as well. So, um, lots of great research and lots of great uh, information available um, to support uh, evidence-informed approaches via the Education Endowment Foundation. Um, and uh, they're well worth a follow on Twitter as well, sharing their reports and uh, other uh, activities. So please, please do give the Education Endowment Foundation a follow if you haven't done so before. Um, but it's a great toolkit and they've released loads of uh, reports over the past uh, six years or so, I think it is, since they, they say started. One such report is this one. Um, which, this is a summary of that report, which was uh, uh, released um, uh, March 2019, March last year. And in that report, they broke down uh, different ways in which technology can be found to have an impact and uh, make a difference to supporting uh, teaching and learning based upon a variety of research studies they'd undertaken. One of the first things, which is uh, kind of a no brainer, really, is to um, think carefully about how uh, technology will improve teaching and learning before actually introducing it. Uh, this isn't necessarily about uh, what we're covering over the course of the day uh, of the session today, um, but um, certainly it is important, um, I think. And uh, if you do want to have impactful use of technology, um, it, some of the things I'll share with you today, for example, John and, and others, um, technology it can seem really, really exciting. And, but just because you can do it, doesn't necessarily mean, like I say, that you, you have to do these things. So just because it appears exciting um, doesn't mean to say you should have to sort of do it and use it. I always start with that uh, sort of Michael Fullen uh, um, kind of approach, which is a pedagogy first approach. Think about how um, uh, pedagogy is the, the driver uh, and then how can technology accelerate that? The quote from Fullen is um, pedagogy is the driver, technology is the accelerator. And certainly um, using technology can really supercharge your teaching in lots of impactful ways. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll get some of those from this session today. But thinking again, it is important to think carefully about how you're going to use technology before you actually start using it uh, with your learners. Because again, once that horse has bolted, it's very, very hard to sort of put it back in the bag, uh, as it were. Um, so yeah, consider how technology will improve your teaching and learning before you actually introduce it. Uh, the next thing, and this is where um, today's session sort of ties in, is where they talk about how technology can be used to improve the quality of explanations and modelling. There are loads of ways in which uh, technology can be used to in improve this, uh, and I'll unpick that in more detail uh, throughout the course of this session. The other two ways that um, the EEF found that technology can support teaching and learning was through uh, improving the impact of pupil practice, uh, and that's uh, um, can be done in lots of different ways. And I've, I've actually run uh, other sessions as part of the Global Ed Tech Academy on how technology can improve or Microsoft tools can improve the impact of pupil practice. Um, so please do check that out on the Global EdTech Academy playlist. 
um, or, or drop me a line and get in touch if you'd like some help with that as well. They're yeah, very happy to uh, support with these different things. So yeah, it can be uh, used through um, low stakes quizzing, retrieval practice, uh, getting students to use the recording features of PowerPoint to uh, record their presentations and demonstrate their oracy and knowledge and skills and understanding and uh, all that sort of stuff. If you've got access to it uh, using tools uh, such as live inking, so you can uh, sort of really highlight key points while you're doing it and demonstrate things really, really clearly. Uh, there are loads of ways in which we can use technology to do these sorts of things, and it really does have the potential to increase the quality and quantity of practice that people tend to take inside and outside of the classroom. The next section um, in the uh, summary uh, reports talked about how technology can play a role in improving assessment and feedback, and things such as Microsoft Forms are super helpful. Uh, in doing those sorts of things, peer assessment through recording, uh, doing sort of peer feedback recordings um, in PowerPoint or using Flipgrid. Or there are loads of ways uh, in which you can use technology to play a role in improving this feedback as well. And that has uh, um, been covered by me in another Global Ed Academy session uh, as well. Uh, using your voice to record yourself talking over a presentation a, a child has done for you, for example, uh, having conversations or peer assessment through Teams, many 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 ways that technology can play a role in improving assessments and feedback so those are the four sort of key areas we're today going to be focusing on the ways that technology can be used to improve the quality of explanations and modeling and i break it down into sort of three key areas when it comes to thinking about technology uh, and its use in supporting teaching and learning um, and, and you as a teacher in a classroom and i break them into sort of three key things to remember firstly and these are questions to ask yourself already. Is, is what I'm going to be using in the tech in, in is the technology use that I'm going to be doing using making use of uh, in the classroom going to enhance learning? If so, you're on the right track. Um, will it uh, support my teaching? Uh, so it might necessarily be something which actually helps learners with their with their job of learning, but actually get your job as a teacher a little bit easier. Um, and the final one is. Uh, speeding up processes, which is kind of similar to the second one, uh, but this is where you can use things like Microsoft Forms, for example, to run quizzes with your learners. Uh, they can be auto assessed and marked and, and uh, all these kinds of things. So uh, there are loads of ways in which we, we can use tech to uh, speed up processes. And again, I've got some examples of showing uh, each of these three areas during the course of this session with you today. The research says uh, when it comes to explanations, that effective explanations are likely to involve the following things material being introduced in logical steps with new ideas being explicitly linked to people's prior experiences and knowledge. Now, I'm kind of trying to model this in how I'm delivering this particular slide. I could have, for example, had all of that information on the screen at the same time. But what I've done is some simple animations just to actually introduce it in logical steps. So I started here and without putting any more of the information which goes in uh, just down here, I've been able to introduce that, uh, um, that idea of what an effective explanation looks like um, in a logical step. And I'm doing it very, very simply just using uh, the um, animation tools uh, in PowerPoint. And we can think about that carefully and do that. It's really important to make sure uh, that what we do is, is not too burdensome. Um, and because we want it to make it nice and easy for people to use the technology in the classroom as well. I always share that it's going to take you longer to prepare for your session or your lesson um, where you want to use technology uh, than the lesson itself is going to take. Then seriously consider, is it worth actually using that technology? But things such as introducing um, uh, sections uh, in, a, in a logical manner, uh, just through using simple animations like I've done here, is a super easy way of uh, bringing in effective explanations and doing things in ways which don't bring too much cognitive load and so forth and so on. So we're looking to uh, improve the quality of your explanations and modeling using 365. So here's an example and I've, I, I've sort of shared it in, in uh, uh, a little way with the animations that we had there. Um, here's another way in which we could do it. Let's say um, as teachers we understand uh, what feedback is. Feedback is um, sort of intrinsically tied into this idea called the feedback loop. Now I could 
uh, viewers and um, have every bit of information that I want on this slide right now. If I had all the things on this slide that I wanted you to see straight away, then what would happen would be you'd be reading every little bit, not in the order I want it to be uh, sort of viewed in. Uh, it wouldn't tie in with my um, speaker voice, my teacher voice, my oracy, the explanations uh, uh, and the modelling that I'm doing. And so I've used some simple animations to help explain the feedback loop. So, for example, the feedback loop starts with a student undertaking some kind of activity and that could be written, it could be practical, it could be hands on, it could be some writing, uh, it could be uh, a performance, it could be all sorts of things. But the student will do something uh, that is received in some way, shape or form by me as their teacher. Now, I say it could be a video of a performance, it could be a typed essay, it could be um, all manner of different things. OK, but the idea with feedback is that I receive it. And as Dylan Willem says, um, it should be more feedback for the uh, recipient than the uh, donor. Uh, so um, we, we do some uh, some marking, we, we give some feedback which uh, is kind, specific and helpful as per the writings of Ron Berger. So we, we submit it back to the student and we do these things. Uh, at regular and specific improvement points. And we do this so that we can close the learning gap and so that learning is informed. And that's really, really important that we do this because if we don't do this, then learners aren't going to make the progress. They're not going to know how to move on with their next steps. It's really, really key. And we, and we do this so that we can adapt our teaching uh, based upon student responses so that we're responsive uh, to the needs of our learners. Now, as I said at the beginning of this slide, I could have just started this slide with every piece of information on there. But as somebody viewing the presentation, somebody viewing this in my class, they're just going to read ahead and see all that stuff and not get the nuance of all the different sections. It is a better delivery. I'm giving a better explanation um, if I am doing it in that way. And all I have done is just put some simple animations onto my slides in order for that to happen. How many uh, times have you observed a lesson or have you even taught a lesson yourself? And I'll put my hand up. I've done this many, many times myself. I have brought up a slide uh, earlier in my career. I bring up a slide with some text on it and I would just stand. I would read through that text. That is not good teaching. That is not good use of PowerPoint. And we can use some simple tools to just help us make things that little bit better. And uh, when it comes to how we explain things with our learners, if we were a maths teacher, we wouldn't put the question and all the workings and all the bits of the response on the board at the same time, would we? You know, we'd work our way through, we'd, we'd put in the various points, we'd take sort of, uh, comments from the students in the class, we'd write on the whiteboard or we'd, you know, we'd, we'd mark up on, onto our slide or whatever it is that we wanted to do. We do all of that as it happened, rather than having boof, everything there on screen. So this is just simple ways to improve um, your your uh, your explanations and modelling to learners uh, in the classroom. And speaking of a maths example, here's one. I, I could have just to say, just given the students all of this stuff. I could have given them the thing down here about Peter can mow the lawn. I could uh, have given the in instructions here. I could have turned it into uh, this here, but that's too much. If you're a student in the classroom and this is what you're being asked to think about and learn about and so forth and so on, this isn't that helpful. What we really need is something which is going to actually talk us through each of those different sections. You know, I could have had it all like this. Again, everything here, this is the third part, here's all the response and, and how we answer it all here. Again, not that useful uh, to learners when we're delivering to them, um, particularly if we're going to be doing things around remote learning as well. We, we, we can't easily see, if we're delivering like I am right now, I can't see all the faces of my students in the classroom. I can't see if they're understanding it or getting it or any of those sorts of things. So again, taking on board what I've shared previously about using simple animations, it's far better to do something like this. So we've got this question where Peter can mow the lawn, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to read that to you because you can read the question. OK, but we've, been, we've got a prompt. We've got a call to action, something that students, learners need to think about. So I could now, given that I've just had and put that little bit of information on the screen. So we've been learning about how to solve problems like this class, haven't we? What are the next steps? What are the first things we need to do? And then you know, students can open their mics or uh, come back and respond or however it is. If you're live in the classroom, you, know, you can take responses from, from students face to face in the classroom. 
and once the students have unpicked the, the correct way of doing it, you can then bring in the next pick. Yeah, you're right, very good. Step one is to assign the variables, and X should be a variable we should use, and that would be the time to mow the lawn together. So how do we then sort of turn that into anything that we do? What is the formula that we need to use for that? So that, that's right, well done, John. That's 1 over 40 plus 1 over 60, which equals 1 over X. That's correct, well done, thank you. So we now need to try and work out how we do this. So how do we do this? OK, well, as luck would have it, I seem to have things prepared on the other slide here. So the first thing to do is to solve the equation and to solve the equation, as we've just discussed, is to find the lowest common multiple of 40 and 60 and that's 120. So what do we need to do next? Uh, well, thank you, John. We now need to know we need to multiply both sides with 120. Very good. Absolutely. So what does that look like? Well, we have to find both by 120. So that will look like that. OK, fantastic. Well done. Uh, so who can tell me what we do next? Can you see where I'm going with this, uh, viewers? Uh, I'm just taking things through step by step. Uh, I've animated each of the various parts of this. Now, it doesn't have to be done this way. I've taken a picture and just animated each section of that picture. It doesn't have to be the picture. I could actually just be inking. If you've got the, uh, the facility to do this um, on uh, devices in your school or on your um, surfaces or your iPads or uh, your Chromebooks, lots of different devices have um uh, touch screen uh, capabilities these days um and uh, say office 365 microsoft 365 works on all the platforms i've just mentioned all the devices i've just mentioned uh, so this is absolutely something that you could uh, think about and undertake and, and uh, do with uh, these devices in your classroom and as i work through my uh, different animations uh, we can see that we've broken down so we're down at nil at the end 5x equals 20 so how many times does 5 go into 120 and when it goes into 120 24 times therefore x equals 24. And this isn't groundbreaking and actually a lot of uh, research and evidence informed uses of technology isn't that groundbreaking. Some of it really, really is. And I'm going to share some of those things with you in just a few moments. Um, but um, this isn't the most sexy of approaches. Absolutely not. But we're in the business of helping students with their learning through our teaching. Uh, we're not in the business of making things woohoo uh, just because it might be fun. Uh, yes, there are occasions at the end of term, perhaps, when things might be, you know, be, be good for doing those sort of things. But for, for the most part, it's the hard yards and students having to go in and, and uh, spend the hard yards and, and put in the time to understand how to solve all these different things and, and work them all out with your support. So how can we best do that? Well, again, using simple animations like I'm showing you uh, through here right now is the best way uh, to do that. Uh, just a handy hint as well, uh, viewers, um, if you want to, um, I'll just jump out of my presentation for a second. Uh, uh, no, I don't want to keep my ink annotations. I'll just discard those. Um, and it seems to have jumped right through to the end of my presentation, so I'll just stop there for a second. I want to share with you how easy it is to actually animate all these different things in the steps that you want them to appear. Is simply a case of simply just uh, clicking on the things in the order in which you want them to appear. I've gone to the wrong slide here. Here we go. Clicking on things in the order in which you want them to appear. So I want that to appear first. I'm going to press Control on my keyboard, and as I then tap on each of the next sections, it will then add uh, and put those, and then two, and then 120, and then so forth and so on. Click. Uh, press control and tap on each of these different um, elements that you've got in your on your slide in the order in which you want them to animate and then you just simply go to your animations and put in whatever animation you want slide in fade whatever option you want to go for but because you've chosen these by pressing control and click and you've clicked on them in the order in which you want them to actually appear on your screen when it comes to doing the animations they will then appear in the order in which you've actually selected them which will save you a whole lot of messing around in terms of sort of dragging it around in the animation uh, pane on the side and getting them in the right order and all that sort of stuff. You don't have to either, which I've seen some colleagues do in the past, animate each one one by one. That's a slow, slow job. And again, not really linked to how I would want uh, people to be thinking about using uh, technology um, uh, for these sorts of purposes. So there are loads of ways in which we can um, undertake these different activities. Um, I say I've done it through the animations bit here. I've done or how about again just here and bring the screen back up again. Um, and again, we could, as we were saying, uh, just actually do it by hand uh, using the inking features. 
I'm not going to run through the solution here. I'm just, just inking the screen just to show you that we can ink it and we can do all those things and talk through those things in time like so. So that's one way in which we can do these sorts of things uh, super simply and easily. Uh, another uh, reason why we uh, talk about these sort of things is there's lots of research which shows how visualizers can improve the quality of applications and modeling. Um, and uh, in the Education Endowment Foundation's uh, report, and you can see the link there, 2017, Improving Math Mathematics in Key Stages 2 and 3. Uh, in this report, they talk about visualizers and how they can help um, if they enable teachers to do the following things. They show people a wider range of high quality models than they would otherwise be able to do which links through to something uh, by Ruben Puentejura, the creator of the SAMA model. Uh, in there, he talks about how uh, using technology, or uh, well, technology is best uh, deployed or being used uh, when it's doing things that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the technology. And certainly uh, under lockdown, if it wasn't for the technology we had available to us, doing things like I'm doing with you today through Teams, uh, you know, the, the continu uh, continuity of learning would not have taken place. Uh, the uptake of, of Teams and, and its uh, associated tools during the course of the pandemic has, has been a real massive support for uh, educators the world over, um, which makes it such a, a huge privilege for me to be able to uh, sort of be asked to be uh, sharing these things with you uh, and linked to uh, work with Q and Microsoft. But yeah, visualizers, that's a specific piece of kit, but if we've got tools such as a, a device I'm using today, I'm using a Surface Pro today, and we can do similar things with other, other tablets or other, other um, uh, devices with Windows on, we can use the devices themselves as visualizers without actually having to have a visualizer. So for example, I could have a model on my table in front of me right now. I could just use the back camera, point it downwards, and then do the annotations and the live demonstrations and things that way, for example. You don't necessarily have to have a visualizer in order to get the uh, learning wind that using a visualizer can bring. Um, and so the other thing is about using the um, visualizer or the cameras or, or the tools which are built into um, the various Microsoft products, even with the whiteboard that comes as standard within your team setup, just using these things to increase the precision with which you can um, sort of share, explain or uh, worked examples. Um, it can have a big impact and a difference. And that's why I chose the um, example I did with the animations before, because um, going through and increasing the precision of um, me explaining that worked example, um, as it says here, it has consistently been found to increase learning, uh, particularly as it says here in mathematics. It's really uh, great. So what can we use? What other tools can we use uh, to improve the explanations, uh, the quality of our explanations and modeling? Well, there are loads of things we can use. We've got OneNote class notebook uh, inside OneNote, and please then um, do check out if you haven't seen it. Uh, Matt Miller did a great session last week, uh, which will be on the um, uh, Q uh, YouTube channel now on uh, using OneNote uh, class notebook. I joined that session. It was absolutely fantastic. Really, 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 really good. Uh, another great tool is uh, Office Lens. Uh, Office Lens uh, available on um, Android, iOS, and uh, on your Windows device, and it loads the camera. And what's great about Office Lens is that it takes a snapshot um, using the camera, uh, brings that through, uh, crops down any, um, uh, particularly with documents or, or whiteboards or other displays, it crops around the edges and uh, then uh, brings that image through uh, for you to put into a variety of different spaces and places. You can also use it um, as a visualising tool. So let's say a student, you're in class this time. Uh, you're in class and a student has done a piece of work uh, in their book and you want to share that with the rest of the class uh, quickly open up office lens take a quick snapshot of it and before you know it um, office lens has trimmed the edges um, and you're able to and you can use it through mirror casting or screen casting uh, uh, so screen mirroring and up to your board or you could drop the uh, documents um, straight into OneNote class notebook uh, and then directly straight away through Office Lens um, you're, you're there able to annotate and work through and deliver peer feedback, peer assessments or your own feedback and your own assessments uh, live to the class. Similarly, <coughs> excuse me, similarly you can send those things directly through into PowerPoint and um, I want to sort of share these last two things with you Excel and Forms with a bit of an example. Uh, so um, to help with this example, um, I'm just going to jump out of here for a second. Don't want to keep those incantations, just going to discard those. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to grab this uh, URL here 
and paste it into our chat um, in Teams. So just give me a second just to jump back into Teams here. And uh, with this, uh, there's two things I want to share with you on this. Forgive the fact this brought the, there we go, uh, it's brought the um, uh, formatting across into the chat there. But could you jump across into that spreadsheet for me now, please, uh, um, Edwardy? And uh, I was going to bring it up onto the screen here. And we're first of all, looking at uh, this, this isn't actually linked to um, what we're doing today, but I thought I'd share it with you anyway. Can you go to the tab um, where it says checking in sheet once you're inside the Excel spreadsheet? Uh, this is something I've been doing with groups I've been working with. This is a great way of, of catching up and checking in with learners. Um, it, it, it makes it so that it's anonymous, um, so that it's very easy for you to just see really clearly and quickly. Uh, but just rag rate how you're feeling today. So that's what you're somebody straight in with a green. And, and you know, if you've got 30 students, you can quickly sort of take the temperature of learning in the classroom uh, really, really quickly. The reason why I created this spreadsheet is to show you the power of modeling um, in, in a variety of ways, though. And I've cheated a little bit because I haven't created a Google, uh, sorry, a, a Microsoft form uh, to go with this. What I've done is I've just created the spreadsheet. But when you create a Microsoft form, uh, you can make it so that the results go directly through into a spreadsheet. So let's say, for example, you're a teacher, you're asking your class to undertake an experiment uh, where they're recording the temperature of something over a period of time. If you could just jump into the tab at the bottom that says model example, and I'll show you how we can do that. Um, I can see a guest, the guest is already in cell B2. Uh, so um, let's say we're looking to see how long it takes for, oh, he's been moved now. Uh, we're looking to uh, record from a variety of learners in the classroom um, uh, how uh, a variety of temperatures over time uh, in, as part of an experiment. Uh, they can fill that information in in a Microsoft form. And as they start to fill the information in, uh, so uh, I'll just put in some random numbers here. As they start to put the numbers in, so the chart that's been generated is automatically going up, 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 up with the information that I've put in there. Now, if we have already set this up um, as the activity uh, through forms with it feeding through directly into Excel, then afterwards, this is a great way of students. So students are undertaking the activity in your classroom. What you're doing as teacher is just displaying sheet one, in fact, uh, on the board. And sheet one is just a representation of that chart that we've just uh, seen being built directly inside um, the tabbed uh, the worksheet at the bottom model example. So if you're looking to improve the quality of modeling and, and engage learners in actually seeing how things work, if you, if you, you know, a key, a, a cornerstone of uh, science education is <clears throat> when you're undertaking activities such as experiments, it's the opportunity for learners uh, to really see science in action. And so if they're recording uh, a variety of things, you know, being able to see the chart being filled in live as every member of the class is undertaking that experiment. That's a fantastic way of getting them to say whether or not their, their hypotheses are correct, um, what's actually happening with the experiment, is it what they expected to happen? So as teacher, all you really need to then have is this particular chart on the screen in front of you. The learners can be getting on with the busy jobs of doing the experiments. You can be walking around the classroom, uh, supporting them with their activities, supporting them with the uh, use of the um, uh, and lab equipment and all these different things and on your screen um, upon the big upon the projector in, in the class everyone can see all of the results coming in live right in front of them that that is super powerful saves you a lot of work saves them a lot of work and uh, a good friend of mine Jules Dolby um, talks an awful lot about removing the secretarial from um, teaching and learning now I, you know I've, I've uh, taught for many years myself and I've seen lots of lessons as well and I've seen lessons where some students well all students are being asked to you know create the charts and, and don't get me wrong building charts recording results doing all those things are superbly important skills but in a lesson where you're wanting students to actually reflect on temperatures, what, what's the key learning outcome for that lesson? So there might be a cross curricular theme with you know, creating charts and so forth and so on. But what you're most interested in as a science teacher doing this experiment is the learning related to temperatures, not building charts. So removing the secretarial, you've created the form for the students to fill in. They don't have to make that form. They haven't got to create that survey. They haven't got to 
um, collate all of the results from all the students in the class in one go. They don't have to build the chart afterwards. They can spend more time then unpicking the results, which is what you would want as a science teacher. Those are the things you'd want to be happening. And so this is a simple way of, of using technology to improve the quality of the modelling that you do uh, within this particular kind of activity. And this could be used in lots of different ways. It could be um, that you're on a field trip somewhere and students are using mobile devices, for example, to fill in results of flower counting when you're doing plant diversity in a field or whatever it is that you're undertaking as your activity. There are loads of ways in which you can use forms in Excel uh, and then building charts before any data is put into them to actually make a really rich resource uh, to support your teaching and their learning. And so that's the idea behind that. Um, because this session, as you remember, as you remember uh, is uh, all about uh, using technology um, to improve the quality of explanations and modelling. So I'm just going to be back into PowerPoint now. I'm just going to give you a uh, uh, check of time a second. Let me just jump into Teams for a second. Does anybody have any questions about anything that I've shared with you so far? I've got a few more examples to share with you, but um, just jumping back into Teams for a second. Does anybody have any questions about anything that I've shared so far? As I said, I'm not seeing any hands being put up or anything yet, so that's all good. But um, yeah, any any comments or questions about anything so far? All right, brilliant. Thanks, John. Thanks for the feedback. Hope the same is true for you, Anna, uh, Anima, and uh, Jessica. Uh, do you have the equation editor feature in PowerPoint? Uh, I'll be honest, guest, guest. I don't know the answer to that question. I do know there's a fantastic um, uh, maths tool built into OneNote class notebook. Um, but um, as, as for the answer to the question about the equation editor, I don't know that. Um, but I can find out for you, not during this session, but if you can send, give me some details. And there you go, Anima is saying yes, thank you. That saved me having to go off and find out the answer for you. But again, like I said at the outstart of the session today, um, if you want to follow up, please do um, drop me a line at ICT Evangelist. I'm very, very happy to uh, follow up on any questions you may have beyond this session. Uh, and that goes uh, to um, sort of follow, uh, watching back viewers afterwards on YouTube. Uh, if you do have any questions following this, please do drop me a line at ICT Evangelist. I'm always very happy to take uh, follow up questions after a session. Uh, thank you, guest, guest, for the question. And thanks, uh, Anima. Uh, for for the uh, response there. I appreciate that. Thank you. So uh, jumping back into the presentation now, I just want to share, um, uh, and I mentioned this quote from uh, Ruben Puente Jura uh, previously, uh, how about how uh, it, this is again linked to his SAMA model, substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition. Um, it gives, technology gives us the opportunity to do things that wouldn't be possible uh, without the technology. And that can really help us to steer our thinking. And, I, and I've certainly uh, in this session again uh, talked about the importance of making sure that we choose to use technology for purposeful, uh, the wow factor. But I wanted to spend uh, a moment uh, here now towards the end of the session uh, talking about the use of 3D models because 3D models, you know, are are, are a fantastic. They're really really um, uh, engaging um, and, and give us the opportunity to do things. Uh, that wouldn't be possible uh, without the technology. Uh, just uh, going to jump back into that slide again a second. Uh, if I was teaching this, for example, uh, about the human heart, um, again, a science example, uh, but when we are working in uh, the uh, lab, you know, it's, it's not very easy when we're going to be doing a dissection with our learners uh, to get them to know exactly all the things they should be needing to know uh, before they actually get a heart uh, in front of them for that dissection activity. You'll, you'll do some pre-work before all of that. Now, what better way to do some pre-work with all of that uh, than to actually um, play with the models uh, beforehand? And these are 3D models. Um, if I just jump out for a second here, and I'll just go back to the heart example here. Um, I can actually really easily uh, engage with this 3D model. If I just uh, go onto this uh, handle here in the middle, I can actually click on that and drag that model around live within my actual PowerPoint slide. Now, it could be that I wanted to sort of point out uh, just over here, we have got, uh, I'm just turning inking on a second, now that I've got the right angle. 
bring this up for you. You can see very clearly just over here. This is the tricuspid valve. Uh, it's called the tri. As you can see there are three parts to it just here. Uh, this here is the bicuspid and that's because you've got two. Uh, here you've got your aorta, your so forth and so on. I might be wrong because I'm not a science teacher. Uh, I'm just pulling on some science learning that I had from biology uh, way back when. Uh, you've got the wall, you've got the capillaries, so forth and so on. But again, this is using technology to really, really ramp up the quality of your explanations and modelling and using the technology to do things that wouldn't necessarily be possible uh, if it weren't for the technology. Uh, there are loads and loads of 3D models uh, that come directly within PowerPoint. Uh, a question that I often have um, uh, when I'm talking about these 3D models, and uh, here's a, a chemistry example here as well. And I am definitely not the person to be explaining things about chemistry. I am definitely not a chemist. Um, but I do know from speaking to people who are uh, that using these sorts of features to talk about bonds and covalent bonds and these different things um, are super helpful in helping learners to visualize things and do things that uh, again going back to that point of jira thing uh, using technology to do things that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the technology so um, once the 3d model is in there are things you can do with a 3d model uh, you'll see already that i've got the 3d model option here uh, at the top here and i can uh, jump really quickly and easily uh, to different 3d model views uh, I can also, if I go to the animations uh, tab here, we can see that we've actually got some 3D uh, uh, options as well. So we've got a turntable to arrive, we can jump and turns and so forth and so on. And just like any animation inside PowerPoint, you can really get in and dig deep and tweak the animation to be exactly as you want it to be and to work for you however you want it to work for you within the animations pane just here. That's super, super useful. Um, but how do we actually go about putting one of these 3D models in? Well, there are two ways in which you can put uh, uh, 3D models in. Actually, there are, there are three ways I'll share with you. The first way is the easiest way um, if there's a model that exists for you to use already. So if you go to the insert ribbon and go to where it says 3D models just here, and then you can type in um, what you're looking for. OK, so let's say I'm looking for lungs, L-U-N-G-S. I hit the return key and there I've got a 3D model of some lungs to look at. You can browse through all the different collections as well. Some of them are not that linked to education, uh, but can be used in lots of different ways. Uh, clothing, for example, um, dinosaurs are particularly good for young people, shapes, math symbols, um, you know, space animals. Even clothing has got use in uh, the ESOL uh, type lessons or language learning. There are loads of ways in which you can use these models um, inside your classes. You can even use them for storytelling, uh, linking together different animations and doing it that way. But what if there's an, a, a model that you want uh, that isn't available? Well, there's a variety of things you can do there to support you as well. Uh, the first one I'm going to share with you is this website here. If I just jump into uh, Edge a second and go onto this tab here. Uh, this website here, thingiverse.com, has a whole plethora of different 3D models uh, that you can download and use directly with inside PowerPoint. Uh, the big issue um, with, um, and, and you've got the lovely Pikachu there, but um, the, the um, issue, however, with um, the uh, 3D models that you get from MakerBot is that they are just wireframe models. That means that you just get the sort of shape you don't get the colouring in. So let's say, for argument's sake, you wanted to use this Tesla truck, uh, Tesla Cybertruck just here. OK, uh, the freedom model can be downloaded and put into a presentation, but none of this colouring in would be on there whatsoever. So what do you do and how do you go about fixing all of that? Uh, well, Microsoft have a fantastic uh, tool available to uh, you uh, called Paint 3D. And in Paint 3D, you can um, bring in any Thingiverse um, wireframe model uh, that you've made and you can color it in and then you can either save it in paint 3d as a 3d model file or you can actually just copy and paste it uh, so you can click on it so here's a nemo one that i did earlier uh, and you just press uh, Control and c to copy that and then you can go pop across back into uh, powerpoint and just paste it in there but what i haven't told you is that i've actually cheated a little bit this wireframe model that i've built this nemo on 
hasn't actually come from Thingiverse. And you can see I've done both sides, look. OK, uh, but um, this is actually a wireframe uh, that's actually directly inside Paint 3D. If you go into your 3D library, uh, you'll see when it comes up, there's a whole bunch of uh, the other models that we've seen previously. It might take a little while to come through on there, but those are the same ones as we saw uh, in PowerPoint. But if we go to 3D shapes uh, instead, and then just pull this out here, you'll see that there's a whole variety of different 3D objects. This is the fish one that I had for Nemo. You've got cat, you've got dog, you've got people, a variety of mathematical shapes and, and objects you can use to build things and all of these things. And once they're in here is the wireframes, like I said, it's a very simple job then to just select the item and then do control and C and then drop yourself back over into PowerPoint. I'll just remove this uh, chemistry uh, one here. I just do control and V. It'll take a few seconds because as you can imagine with a 3D model, it's quite a big thing to bring across. But all I've done is done copy and paste and it will just copy and paste that uh, 3D model of Nemo directly from um, Paint 3D directly into uh, PowerPoint. Now, I'm not suggesting uh, um, in a science class, you know, you, you want to be doing things with uh, Nemos and, and all of this sort of stuff. Uh, I, I am purely trying to show you what is possible uh, with the technology. OK, it could be any kind of 3D models. Um, although I have seen uh, some primary school students telling little stories where they've animated Nemo doing this and going and putting you know, a coral reef background in and all these different things. They used a PowerPoint recorder to record their voices over the top and turning it into a little story. They've duplicated the, uh, and this is a little trick, rather than copy and paste, just click on the item you want to, to duplicate and press Control and D. And that will then just duplicate it. So I'm just going to reduce that one down. And you can make a whole school of fish, uh, a school of little clownfish, um, that you can then just use to animate and create a whole different sequence. You can have them facing different ways. You can animate them in different ways, all that sort of stuff. But it goes back to that quote from Puente Jura, OK, uh, where we're talking about using technology to do things that wouldn't be possible without the technology. So I'm not suggesting that we necessarily all start going over to Paint 3D and, and getting all of our year 10s uh, that are doing GCSE geography to uh, today we're going to learn about Nemo just because we can do it doesn't mean to say we should necessarily do it. But we can certainly use uh, these 3D models when they are linked to purposeful uh, teaching and learning ideas and the models can be of use to us. So look, um, this is uh, sort of 10 minutes left of the session. Uh, I built in some time for us to have some Q&A and uh, for you to have a little play with those things if you wanted to with me nearby to help if you want, had any questions about it. Um, but um, I wanted to just uh, recap. Uh, we said we'd have a look at the evidence or what the research says. Uh, I said that I would share some ideas for how you could do it. And I said there'd be some time for Q&A and uh, some time to explore some of the things that we've had a little look at uh, during the course of the session. I hope you've got some good ideas and uh, some takeaways for you to uh, as well as I think about in your use of Microsoft tools in school. Um, so that leads me to say thank you very much for coming to the session. Um, uh, are there any questions? Please add them into the chat in Teams. Uh, please don't forget to follow me on Twitter uh, at ICT Evangelist. Uh, I'd love some feedback from the session as well. I hope you have found it useful. And don't forget to use the hashtags GETA for the Global EdTech Academy, uh, WeRQ, and uh, Microsoft EDU. And of course, you can always use the Ask ICT Evangelist uh, hashtag if you've got any questions. So that leads me to wrap things up for this part, uh, and I'll jump into Teams now. Uh, but thank you so much for coming to this session. I hope you found it useful. And uh, please do join the Getter. It's up running every single day. Uh, and uh, if you check my timeline, actually, you'll see the variety of sessions uh, that are taking place today. There are loads and loads. Uh, if you are UK based, I mean, they go right through until uh, half past 12 tonight. Um, so uh, loads and loads of things available. Um, and it's not just about using the um, uh, EdTech tools as well. Vernon Wright, for example, his session at 12.30 today uh, is talking about uh, uh, approaches to leadership. Uh, so there's a whole variety of activities and uh, professional learning opportunities being provided through uh, the Global EdTech Academy. So let's jump in back into uh, Teams now and see if there's any further uh, questions. Okie dokie. Uh, very interesting. Are these available in PowerPoint? Um, I'm guessing uh, from Anima that's a question about the 3D models. Um, if it is, 
Uh, as you saw, the 3D models are available inside PowerPoint. Um, you can still see the option just outside Teams, actually, hopefully. Um, you can see the 3D models option just here. Um, I did share with you, actually, just jumping back in a second uh, to PowerPoint, I did say there are a variety of ways you can bring these things in. Uh, it is super easy. Um, if you were to make a model inside Paint 3D, obviously copying and pasting from one side to the other is, 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 is lovely and all those things, uh, but I do always share it's important to save early and save often. Uh, so make sure you get uh, your various models that you may have made in PowerPoint, uh, sorry, in, in uh, Paint 3D saved. Um, and the other way in which you can bring the model through into PowerPoint is simply rather than going onto the 3D models uh, bigger uh, option here, click on the little drop down and in there you've got an option that says from a file. Choose that option and you can then find the 3D file that you've made in Paint 3D and then bring it in that way. I tend to use the copy and pasting because it is quicker to do that, um, although it does rag uh, the device a little bit uh, during the process of the copying and pasting. Uh, but I will always save my file uh, so that if things do go a little bit pear shaped, uh, I've always got that file to go back to to bring across again should I need to. OK, so that uh, hopefully uh, answered that from Anima. Uh, John, uh, just a nice comment saying thank you. Very useful. OK, uh, so are there any other questions from anybody today as part of this session? I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. So I'm going to just come back to uh, being just me on the screen. Does anybody have any other questions at all or comments? One of those times, isn't it? Are people are people typing questions, or is there are there no more questions or comments? Let's give it a few more moments. If not, uh, then I will uh, wrap things up. And uh, oh, John, good question. Yes, uh, where can we find the recordings for the previous sessions? I did say I would share that with you. Uh, it's very easy to find, uh, John. Just go to aka.ms forward slash getter playlist. So that uh, link I've just shared with you there will take you through to YouTube uh, where you can find all of the previous sessions uh, being shared there. And there are like tons. <laughs> there are so many sessions available there. Uh, I don't know what your role is uh, in your school, John, but um, there are uh, many, many, many there. Um, and uh, uh, if you're a Microsoft school uh, and you're looking to provide some CPD uh, and organize that for your colleagues, you know, direct them to the getter, even, you know, just pull across a direct link to some of those uh, specific uh, sessions that are in there. But there are tons in there. That's where you can find the uh, sessions that have already taken place uh, using the same uh, shortener as well, aka.ms uh, getter schedule um, that will show you and they only do them a week in advance unfortunately um, although we've all as presenters we've all already sort of submitted what our sessions are and, and when they're going to be and all the rest of it if you're interested john in finding out when the rest of my sessions are if you go to my website at ictevangelist.com um, one of my recent posts there i'll put the link uh, just in here now if you go to the address I've shared with you there now, uh, one of my most recent posts is about the Global EdTech Academy and all of my sessions and dates and times uh, are available there for you to uh, see. Uh, I, I do have some office hours coming up as well. Those are listed. I, don't, I can't remember the dates off the top of my head, but office hours are drop in sessions where you can drop in and there, there are office hours every single day with um, all of the 40 or so different uh, global EdTech Academy um, presenters and uh, sharers. Um, well, not on all day, every day, obviously, but across every day um, of the week, there are office hours available with one or two of us um, uh, spread across the, the whole of the project as well. So those are available for drop-ins uh, and you can just jump on camera and have a chat about issues or questions you might have around specific topics as well. But so all my forthcoming sessions uh, will be um, uh, uh, listed on that uh, blog post that I've wrote there. Um, how long will they be online for? Are they going to be online indefinitely? That's my understanding, John. Um, I say that's the idea. I believe uh, Microsoft and Q working closely together on all of this, uh, but all the sessions should be there uh, forever and a day for as long. Excuse me. I guess that they're useful 
and as you know john uh, software develops quite a lot over time and it might be that you know in a year's time um you know, microsoft 365 has developed so much that the some of the things that we're sharing are a bit old hat and and uh, it doesn't look the same anymore so some of the stuff might be taken off and then uh, but as far as i know uh, john it's something which is going to be there for uh, for the foreseeable future at least uh, so you can bank on uh, that being um the, the case and being available to you and things Certainly, I've been downloading my own videos and sessions. Thank you, Jessica. Um, if you had any questions or any follow-up, like I say, uh, please do give me uh, a shout. Um, yeah, I think they're going to be there forever and a day, John. And like I said, I'm downloading my videos, so I'm going to better put those onto my channel at some point in time too. So um, awesome. Really lovely feedback, John. Thank you very much. A tweet would be lovely as well if you wanted to uh, shout one of those out. And uh, thank you uh, for your lovely comments uh, to uh, Jessica. Uh, please do feel free, uh, any of you that have uh, come and joined me today, uh, to share anything uh, beyond the session. And like I say, I'm always very happy to take sort of follow-up things afterwards. Um, with that in mind, um, and uh, no further questions or comments, I'm going to end the recording and end the session, and just finish off by saying thank you very, very much for taking the time out of your day today to come and join me for an hour, uh, sort of wittering on about technology and its use in the classroom, when, for most of you, I suspect, is actually your summer holidays. So thank you for your commitments and your dedication. And thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Take care. Cheers.